Um, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear colleagues, uh, it is a great pleasure for me to welcome you today on behalf of the OEC and the Southeast European Cooperative Initiative to our event, presidential and parliamentary elections in Serbia, together with our close cooperation partner EDM, the Rena Institute and uh, the Diplomatische Akademie in Vienna. In this context, I would like to warmly welcome IDM Managing Director Sebastian Schäfer and Gerhard Machel, head of the Department for European Politics at the Karl Renner Institute in person here. Siki's coordinator and uh, EDM's president, Dr. Busek, should have been present today. His uh, unexpected day leaves a very big gap. Uh, Central and Southeastern Europe has lost an extremely dedicated friend and supporter, and we have also lost a mentor and personal friend. We will miss him sorely. The Republic of uh, Serbia with, um, will hold presidential, early parliamentary and 14 local elections on next Sunday, on the April 3rd. These elections will be held under an amended electoral legal framework adopted in February 22, after two parallel inter-party di dialogues facilitated by the European Union and the government, respectively. These changes are intended to improve the transparency of the election process and campaign finance, increase representation of the opposition in the composition of election administration, the institute mid-level election commissions, and to introduce further measures to tackle the above abuse of office and administrative resources, and therefore to regulate the status of election observers. On the other side, Mr. Vucic, uh, the Serbian president, has taken up more than 85% of the media coverage on the presidential elections since the beginning of this year. This challenger, Stravko Bonos, in contrast to him, is mostly portrayed negatively in the media. Mr. Vucic, who is also head of his progressive party, is not only the head of uh, uh, the state, but also um, tells government what to do. That is a uh, kind of uh, um, impressive uh, thing. Moreover, in recent years, the parliament as part of the separation of powers has been practically nullified. And if you look at the influence of uh, President Vucic and his party in the media, in the economy and in the public administration, it is obvious that there are no longer any independent institutions. These elections are also taking place during the ongoing war in Ukraine, which has been dominated uh, the campaign in public messaging and uh, media appearances, according to the regulatory body on electronic media. The EU has increased pressure on Serbia to join its sanctions regime against Russia in retaliation for its invasion of Ukraine. This pressure features heavily among political discussions framed around the elections. Therefore, I would like to thank you for your participation and I wish all of us a successful event and I look forward uh, to our debates and uh, interactions and I uh, would like to give the floor to Sebastian Schäfer now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I would directly hand over to Gerhard uh, Mache, the head of the Department for European Politics at the Karl Renner Institute. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you, Mr. Pazikas. Uh, thank you very much of, to the Southeast European Cooperative Initiative for hosting us this morning. Uh, my name is Gerhard Machel. I'm representing the Karl Renner Institute, the political academy of the Austrian Social Democrats. Warm, a warm welcome also from my side. And uh, at the beginning of my short welcome words, let me also express uh, my personal and my institute's uh, sincere condolences uh, to the IDM and to the to the family of Erhard Busek. Uh, we very much appreciated the cooperation with Mr. Busek, and uh, yeah, the 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 information uh, about his uh, death was a was a shock for us. Uh, the cooperation with the IDM and the Politische Akademie in the framework of this series of events on the elections in Eastern, Central and Southeastern Europe um, was also linked 
to the person of um, Erhard Busek and uh, we as the Karl Renner Institute very much hope that this cooperation will continue even after his um, after his death. Um, Serbia and uh, the Western Balkans are very important to the Karl Renner Institute, to our work, and of course also to the for the work of the other institutions who co-host uh, this and organized this event. Let me bring an example for the Karl Renner Institute. We are co-founder of the initiative Young Generations for the New Balkans 2030 towards alternative horizons. This initiative sets the spotlight on youth, their progressive stances and hopes for the future. And in the framework of this initiative, a delegation of uh, uh, researchers, etc., uh, held talks in Belgrade two weeks ago with officials, with politicians, civil society activists, etc. This uh, also reflects the importance of the elections in Serbia not only for, for Serbia itself, but also for us and the whole region. As I see it, uh, there are three important questions when it comes to the elections in, on Sunday. Um, the first one is, uh, can the three opposition coalitions uh, really challenge President Vucic and his party we know that uh, the opposition largely boycotted the, the last elections two years ago. Now the opposition is running for seats. Can they be successful, even limited successful? The second question touches upon the consequences of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We all know that uh, um, Serbia, for the moment, uh, doesn't take a clear stance. Uh, Serbia condemned uh, half-heartedly uh, the war of aggression against Ukraine, but didn't impose any sanctions. How does this issue um, have an impact on the election in Serbia and on the outcome of the elections? And the third question is very much linked to the second one, how long can Serbia afford not to make clear choice between, so to say, Russia and the European Union? These and many more questions uh, will be discussed in the, in the following discussion. And I very much look forward to the analysis and to the insights of the experts who we invited. Before giving the floor back to Sebastian, I would like to thank once again the cooperation partners. First of all, the Southeastern uh, Cooperation Initiative, Mr. Fasikas. Then, of course, the IDM with uh, Managing Director Sebastian Schäfer and Mr. Daniel Martinek and the Politische Akademie of the ÖVP, represented by Felix Ofner and Lorenz Jan. Many thanks for the good cooperation as always. Let me wish you all an interesting event with a fruitful discussion. And now back to you, Sebastian. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gerhard. Um, thank you also, Dr. Fazekas, for hosting us, but also for the kind words with uh, regards to the chairman of IDM, uh, Dr. Erhard Busek. Um, it's of course not an easy time because it was a very unexpected um, situation. We um, will definitely continue not only this series, but uh, the work of IDM. And um, I'm sure that uh, this is exactly um, what uh, he would have wanted that we continue to uh, monitor the situation in our target region to discuss about the challenges in our target region. And this is what we are doing with this series of uh, parliamentary and uh, in this case, even also presidential and local elections in Serbia. I have a wonderful panel 
with me who are all joining us online, um, which is um, something that uh, has become a new reality. The last parliamentary elections in Serbia were one of the first online live streams that we did. Now we're already uh, very much used to it and uh, I'm very happy um, and I will introduce the panel in alphabetical order with us. Today is Florian Bieber, Director of the Center for Southeast European Studies at the University of Graz. Florian, welcome and thank you for joining us. I have uh, with me Vuyu Ilic, who is a researcher at the Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory at the University of Belgrade, the um, Policy and Research Advisor at the Center for Research, Transparency and Accountability, CRTA. Muyo, thank you for joining us. I have uh, also with me the Secretary General of the National Youth Council of Serbia in uh, Belgrade, Miljana Pejic. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. And with us is also Ivanka Popovic, who is uh, um, a professor and the former rector of the University of Belgrade and vice president of the Danube Rectors Conference. Ivanka, thank you for joining us. It's nice to be here. Thank you. Before we start with the discussion, um, a quick note to our audience in the room and joining us online. You can ask questions. Just raise your hand. If you want to ask a question um, online, just post it into the YouTube live stream chat. My colleagues will transfer these questions then to me. Um, but before we uh, go into the discussion, I would like to ask Vujo Ilic to give us a brief overview over the current situation um, before the elections in Serbia. Vujo, the floor is yours. Sure. Thank you very much for the invitation and for the opportunity to talk about the elections. Uh, so I will bridge, briefly guide you through the through the context in which these elections are taking place. So uh, to start with, um, there will be a general election held in Serbia on Sunday. So voters will be electing members of the National Assembly, the President of the Republic. And in addition to general elections, local elections will be held in 40 municipalities, including the politically important capital city of Belgrade. Uh, so shortly after the 2020 parliamentary elections, the President Vucic announced that early parliamentary elections would take place in 2022, together with the scheduled presidential elections and Belgrade city elections. Uh, just a few things about the electoral system. So the President is directly elected for a five uh, years term from a single nationwide constituency. And if no candidate receives more than 50% of the votes uh, cast a second round would be held uh, between the two best placed candidates within 15 days. Uh, voters will be electing 250 members of the National Assembly, also elected for a term of four years in a proportional system with closed candidate lists uh, and also from a single nationwide constituency. Um, uh, voters in Belgrade will additionally elect 110 members of the city assembly, but they will not elect the mayor. The mayor is indirectly elected by the city assembly members. Uh, as you already know, and as you as you also already mentioned, these elections are taking place in an environment of an ongoing crisis of democratic institutions and increasing political polarization. Uh, the political landscape has since to, uh, to, uh, 2012 been dominated by the Serbian Progressive Party headed by Aleksandar Vucic. Uh, which is served first as a first deputy prime minister from 2012 to 12, uh, 2014, then as a prime minister. And in 2017, he won the presidential elections in the first round and maintained the leadership of the Serbian Progressive Party. Now, the 2016 convocation of the National Assembly was marked by the polarization between the ruling party and the very fragmented opposition as well as uh, several waves of citizen protests uh, following the winter 2018 protests. Uh, most opposition MPs left the parliament and the opposition also later decided to boycott the scheduled elections, citing unfair electoral conditions and limited media freedoms. And this resulted in a record low turnout for parliamentary elections in Serbia in 2020, which was 49%. Uh, so most parliamentary opposition boycotted and the other opposition parties failed to pass the 3% electoral threshold. Uh, so that means that the parties belonging to the ruling coalition received 231 out of 
250 parliamentary mandates, while the four parties representing national minorities received the remaining 19 seats, and again, most of which formed the, the, the majority. Uh, as you already mentioned, from 2019 to 2021, there was an ongoing inter-party dialogue process between the government and the, and the opposition. Uh, it was started in 2019 by the civil society organization and then basically picked up by the members of the European Parliament. And also a second dialogue without foreign mediation was held parallel under the auspices of the Speaker of the Parliament. And although most opposition parties expressed dissatisfaction with the outcomes of the dialogue, they did decide to participate in these 2022 elections. And, and I, I will gladly discuss about why this happened maybe later. Uh, there was a significant change in the legal framework. Uh, the election related framework was mostly stable for almost 20 years in Serbia, with notable change being introduced prior to the 2020 elections when the electoral threshold was reduced from 5% to 3% and then completely revised uh, on February 8th. So basically less than two months before the election day with uh, three completely new electoral laws. And I would say that the Primarily, it affected the structure of electoral administration by introducing a middle tire. So the uh, local electoral commissions between the National Republic and Electoral Commission and the polling boards. There were several other changes I can discuss later, but the scope of these interventions in such a short time frame, I don't think it allowed all political actors time to adequately prepare and especially to these critical changes in electoral administration. Uh, and uh, I have to add that these changes also did not address the long-standing challenges to the integrity of the elections, including long-standing uh, long OSC other recommendations regarding the independence and effectiveness of the body that regulates the media, the misuse of state resources in the campaign, and the pressures on the voters. Um, regarding the, the candidates in these uh, April elections, uh, the incumbent Aleksandar Vucic is a candidate of the ruling coalition of the Serbian Progressive Party, the Socialist Party of Serbia, and the Alliance of Vojvodina Hungarians. Uh, retired General Zdravko Ponoš is a candidate of a centrist opposition United Serbia coalition. University Professor Biljana Stojković is a candidate of a Green Left Alliance Moramo. And the remaining candidates uh, represent the right side of the political spectrum. There will be three candidates representing right-wing coalitions, as well as two far-right candidates. Uh, in comparison to the 2017 elections, uh, when it had a similar number of candidates, 19, and in 2017, all candidates were male. Now we have uh, uh, female candidates uh, uh, for, for uh, after many basic electoral cycles. Um, regarding the parliamentary elections, there are 19 registered lists. Um, unlike the presidential election, the ruling coalition uh, of progressives, socialists, and uh, uh, Alliance of Vojvodina Hungarians run with separate lists in the parliamentary elections. Uh, there will be three opposition coalitions that boycotted the 2020 elections. So the centrist United Serbia, Green Left Alliance Moramo, and former President Stadic, Center Left Social, Democrat, uh, Social Democratic Party coalition. And just note that this list is not, uh, does not have their own presidential candidate. Um, uh, uh, out of the three right-wing opposition coalitions, uh, uh, most of them basically failed to pass the threshold in 2020. Uh, and uh, there will be two far-right lists, the Oath Keepers, uh, who also have a, a presidential candidate, and the Serbian Radical Party, headed by Vojislav Šešel, who submitted the parliamentary list but supports President Vucic's candidature. There will be eight lists that, uh, that were granted national minority status. Besides, I already mentioned the Alliance of Vojvodina Hungarians, which is a part of the ruling coalition with the Serbian Progressive Party. There will be two Albanian lists, two Bosniak lists, one Roma, uh, one Croatian Ruthenian coalition list, and the disputed Russian Greek list, which is fronted by an extreme right figure, which was initially dismissed by the Republic Electoral Commission and later upheld by the Administrative Court. I could talk perhaps about this issue of, of uh, abuse of national minority lists. Um, uh, regarding the voters, there will be 6.5 million voters in the registry, which is a decrease compared to 2020 elections uh, of around 1.25%, which is expected given the population trends. 
Uh, however, uh, as in many other countries in the region, as you must know, the number of registered voters is higher than the voting age population, which is often raising uh, uh, a specter of electoral manipulation uh, accusations. So there are many concerns that involve a voter registry containing either double entries, entries of deceased per persons or, or voters living abroad. This is something that hasn't been resolved for, for a long time in Serbia. Uh, the elections will take place in more than 8,000 8, regular polling stations in Serbia. And two things I would just like to mention is that there will be 77 polling stations uh, open for out-of-country voting in Serbian diplomatic representations in 34 countries this year, which is a higher number, uh, with a high number of almost 40,000 voters applied to vote abroad, indicating Serbian diaspora uh, having high interest in these elections, and a specific situation occurred after the government in Pristina refused to allow voting to take place in Kosovo the way it did in the previous electoral cycles, which was facilitated by the OSCE. So 46 special polling stations will be open for Kosovo Serb voters in four towns in Serbia. Uh, regarding the main issues and the campaign, uh, the ruling party mostly centered their campaign on the economy, uh, especially economic development, foreign investments, and the modernization of the country. Their primary slogan, which is a typical for incumbent parties, achievements speak for themselves. Uh, the United Serbia opposition primarily criticizes the government for the flip side of its economic record. So the rising inequalities, the inflation, the public debt, and the corruption, especially alleging the, the, the ties with organized crime. They promise the voters a change from the root. Uh, there was a wave of ecological protests in the last several years uh, that brought environmental protection to the mainstream of politics in Serbia, and that is a basis of Coalition Moramos program. And uh, on the other side, uh, the right-wing opposition challenges the government's, uh, the government primarily on its foreign policy with regard to EU integration. They want closer ties to, Rus uh, to Russia, and they want Serbia to backtrack from relinquishing elements of sovereignty in, in Kosovo. Uh, we can perhaps discuss how every, all, of, all of this uh, campaign changed uh, after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, so, so I will maybe leave that for later. Um, uh, I also want to mention two important things. So the long-standing practices of abuse of public resources, especially the abuse of public office in election campaign have continued, so it didn't stop. And also uh, uh, the media environment is still tragically polarized uh, uh, with five major televisions, which are the primary channel for information for most uh, voters in Serbia, having a strong pro-government editorial policy and with the privately owned cable outlets with more critical views having limited reach. So this is a uh, this is a uh, environment which also hasn't changed uh, after the interparty dialogue. And maybe just a couple of words about what can we expect uh, on Sunday uh, regarding opinion polls. So opinion polls have been an increasingly contentious topic in Serbian politics. Uh, a lot of political actors are disputing the validity of different polls, alleging they are skewed to serve particular political interests. However, when we see them in the aggregate. Uh, the polls are showing the dominant position of the ruling uh, progressive, uh, Serbian Progressive Party coalition, which together with their junior partner, Socialist Party of Serbia, can expect the support of well above the majority of decided respondents. Uh, the, the, the opposition, so centrist United Serbia and Green Left Moramo, uh, can expect between 20 and 30 percent of the votes together. And right wing opposition is fragmented in, in too many lists, so th two or three will likely pass the 3% threshold. And that means that up to 10% of the votes could end up being passed for the list below the threshold and they will not participate in the distribution of seats. When it comes to presidential elections, um, uh, uh, they are less straightforward. Uh, the, the Alexander Vucic's goal is to repeat the 2017 first round win. But with the expected higher turnout than 2017, that might be more difficult to achieve, probably. Uh, and based on opinion polls, the Belgrade city elections are the most unpredictable. The advantage of the ruling parties is smaller in Belgrade than in the rest of Serbia. And the city is considered a stronghold of the United Serbia and Moramo opposition coalitions. 
However, I would say that the outcome might, to a large extent, depend on the number of opposition lists that pass the, uh, the, the, the threshold. So that will be the thing to look at on, on Sunday. And with that, I, I, I would finish this, uh, this briefing. I hope I didn't take too much time. And I'm, of course, open for any possible clarifications later during the debate. Thank you. We, thank you very much. I think uh, it's a wonderful overview and uh, we have a good start for our discussion and we will certainly get back to some of the points that you have mentioned. Um, but I would like to give now also the other panelists uh, the opportunity to say a few words about their impressions. And I will, uh, would start us off with uh, Miljana, um, especially with regards to um, the, the younger generation. Isn't uh, there a sort of political apathy, frustration, in the sense that when we look at these polls, um, it, it, it really doesn't seem to make a difference um, to engage. Now, uh, the opposition at least um, see, sees uh, the conditions that they would participate again in these, um, in these political dialogue, um, but, but the, the, the outcome seems to be clear. Um, what do you say um, about this and uh, what is your stance um, towards this problem? Uh, thank you so much for the question and um, thanks for, for the very useful introduction um, to this uh, current um, social and political situation that uh, Serbia uh, is facing. Of course, for the National Youth Council of Serbia, our uh, main task uh, during this election campaign was to monitor the reflex reflections of young people to see uh, whether their political standpoints, um, what are their political stand standpoints or the, uh, their participation in the election process, but also to um, monitor the political actors um, to, to see um, how they communicate youth issues toward young people. Do they communicate uh, at all? Um, do they use um, channels of communication what uh, young people are using in order to inform themselves? And what is the general context uh, on how uh, they uh, are delivering their promises and measures uh, in order to improve the position? of young people. And our start point uh, was actually um, um, in our research uh, um, that we publish yearly. It's called the Alternative Report on the Position of um, Young People in the Republic of Serbia, uh, which actually shows that uh, more than 85% uh, of young people believe that they do not influence uh, decision-making process. Um, less than uh, one half actually uh, was willing to engage in political process uh, based on the reasons that they believe that politicians are the same and that uh, they do not offer uh, measures and policies that are in line with their interest. So we wanted to use this political uh, and electoral campaign in order to actually bridge the gap that uh, exists uh, between young people and decision maker. And th this gap is actually evidence-based. Um, the uh, distrust that young people have in the National Assembly is the, the largest. Uh, so um, in comparison to other institutions, for example, in the government, um, in youth offices, in the Ministry of Youth and Sports, the, the trust in National Assembly is much lower. It's, it, it is not much higher the based, uh, I mean, uh, in, in regards to the uh, before mentioned institution as well, but it's very low uh, when it comes to the um, National Youth, uh, when it comes to National Assembly. And uh, although we had, for example, in the uh, previous convocation, um, uh, significantly higher number of uh, young MPs, uh, we see that that didn't make any difference uh, with regards to this communication and representation of young people. Um, and that's why uh, we as the independent um, um, representative body of youth, we wanted to monitor the campaign and the results that we actually published yesterday um, uh, showed that not many political options offered, um, offered concrete measures when it comes to the improvement of um, um, position of young people. Um, some of them um, had um, had measures, but uh, there isn't any system, uh, systematic approach uh, when it comes to the position of young people uh, by any political uh, option and, and party. Um, the um, um, 
team, also the, the policy areas that they covered during the electoral campaign uh, was uh, were um, economical ones. So uh, when it comes to youth employment, when it comes to um, education as well, um, uh, we have monitored and um, we collected a few remarks based on what is needed to be done in order to, to improve youth education, in order to have a better um, uh, position uh, of youth uh, in the labor market and to have a higher chances uh, when it comes to employment. But maybe uh, one of the things that uh, in the previous electoral campaign uh, were not mentioned that much as um, it were uh, during this campaign was the um, topic areas that are uh, very much um, in the heart of young people, which is uh, ecological uh, issues. Um, so the, the questions of ecology and um, uh, for example, the, the um, housing um, issues were very much um, uh, mentioned more um, in comparison to the previous uh, previous campaign. Um, and uh, when it comes to the um, maybe um, um, young people on the list, uh, so what are what are what is the um, the situation now? We see that there are less um, um, young candidates than it were um, in the electoral campaign that was uh, being um, conducted in 2020. So uh, there is less than 15% uh, of um, young uh, candidates uh, on the electoral campaigns. But what is uh, actually the most important here is that they were in the face of the campaign. So um, although some youth issues were mentioned by political um, actors and uh, by those parties that are uh, on the electoral list, uh, very few actors actually were communicated by uh, young people that are candidates on the electoral list. So we had uh, once again situation where older uh, people are discussing in the name of youth, uh, that they are discussing the issues that are um, uh, pressing young people. So we didn't have many opportunities uh, for young politicians to advocate and to um, try to convince their uh, electorate uh, in order to receive um, maybe uh, support. And um, we also uh, followed one, one additional thing this year, um, and that, it, that was actually um, paid um, um, content, also sponsored content on the social media, because as we are very much aware, uh, young people inform themselves uh, more online than, um, than um, that it was before. Um, more than 98% of young people use their mobile phones in order to inform themselves and social media networks. So we wanted to, to see whether political actors actually used this opportunity in order to convince their, um, their younger citizens uh, to support them. Um, and um, uh, the trend of the ruling party uh, having more resources also was very much evident um, during the, the uh, social media uh, promotion. We see that almost in, in March that we analyzed um, um, uh, the most uh, in March only, um, the, the ruling coalition actually spent uh, uh, almost uh, 90,000 um, uh, euros on the uh, sponsored uh, social media content and all other electoral lists um, uh, had one third of it. So um, uh, significantly less uh, resources for um, for a sponsored content. And one of the things that was actually mentioned uh, uh, mentioned, uh, noted uh, um, through the, the analysis of all electoral lists uh, is that uh, all sponsored content that uh, contained um, a message for young people did not target young people. So we don't have this connection uh, uh, where we want to um, convince young people based on the issues that they, are, they perceive to be important to them. Uh, we don't have that that link. So sponsored content about education was um, uh, targeting uh, um, middle uh, middle generations and even elderly uh, and not targeting young people. So uh, that was one of the conclusions based on the social media analysis that uh, this uh, programmatic approach and um, maybe uh, uh, this, this uh, normal uh, process of convincing your electorate to vote for you because you offer uh, 
policies and measures to them does not exist um, uh, in, in Serbia during this election uh, process. Um, and one of the things we uh, noticed uh, based on this analysis is that almost all electoral lists um, specifically targeted first voters um, in comparison to other, other uh, generations of young people. So first voters were specifically targeted uh, by um, um, more resources, uh, so, so more paid content uh, in comparison to, to other, other generations. Um, I believe that I mentioned almost uh, all uh, uh, the most important parts. Of course, I stand at your disposal yeah. for any further clarification. Thank you very much. Yeah, there was uh, a broad variety of, of topics that have been mentioned, but especially also very uh, useful insights when it comes to um, the younger uh, generation um, that is going to vote in this election. Uh, we will come back to some of the topics, but uh, I would uh, like to stay on the on the possibility for, for the opposition um, and the question of the overwhelming dominance of uh, Vucic and uh, his party with uh, regards to the local um, elections that are going to happen. And uh, Ivanka, right, I'm going to ask you, um, it seems to be quite clear who will win the presidential election. It also seems to be quite clear um, with all the um, um, with with all the, the limitations that Wio has uh, mentioned with regards to opinion polls, uh, that also the parliamentary election um, will be uh, won by uh, Vucic party. But uh, the situation in uh, the municipal elections, and especially in Belgrade, might look a little bit different. Uh, could you tell us a bit more how you perceive that um, um, uh, electoral campaign on the, on the municipal uh, level? Uh, thank you, Sebastian, very much for this question. Um, as the previous speakers gave very detailed analysis of the situation, uh, there is not much new that I can add, but I would like to say that I am not an expert in elections or in political science, but just as a concerned citizen, I would see these elections as extremely important and where actually at the municipal level is where a change could be initiated. and. Uh, that's why reaching uh, the young audience, the young voters to participate in elections that will actually shape their future is so important. And um, I know that Ms. Page mentioned a, a lot of information about young people, but what I would also like to mention, there was a government survey done in 2019 about migration trends of students. And the, the survey covered more than 11,000 students. And, one third of those students said they wanted to continue their private and professional life abroad and that they had the full support of their parents for this. So it means they, they're not planning a future in Serbia, which means that they're not interested in, in voting. And th this is one of the serious problems where on the other hand, uh, the senior population of Serbia is very much engaged and is very diligent in uh, uh, fulfilling their uh, right to vote. So I, I see this as a discrepancy and it is really necessary that we have a large turnout. Um, I also believe that um, due to also the media imbalance of presentation of candidates, that um, the situation at the local level at the polling stations will be quite tense. And uh, I hope um, that um, the, simply the voting committees will be able to perform uh, their duties in a normal fashion without any excess uh, um, incidents going on and uh, I think the with the young people there's also a concern about whether they vote or not vote that it will not affect the outcome which is also a disturbing trend but it seems to be quite strong. Uh, I believe that the environmental issues also were something that had a very very strong voice um, in the months before the invasion of Ukraine and this was really taking on um, as a very relevant factor in the local elections, which I think would have affected the, the, these results. But with the invasion of Ukraine, the narrative has shifted, in my opinion, and uh, somehow the focus now is to show that the, the country will be taken care of, that Serbia is safe with the government it has, and most people uh, are very concerned about this aspect, so somehow the environmental aspect has been shoved to a side. 
I hope that at the level of local elections, uh, municipality elections, where these environmental and daily life uh, challenges are really uh, the essence of what municipalities uh, do uh, in their governing function will affect the change. So I am expecting that in certain areas where these environmental and other social issues were very strong, that we could see a shift and that the balance of power in these uh, municipal uh, and city parliaments could change. Uh, and um, that could be the beginning of, uh, let's say, a larger shift in the voice of, of the public. But I think it won't be easy. And uh, um, let, let's say that this expectation is maybe the largest in Belgrade, but uh, I think some smaller municipalities might surprise us in what they will do. And uh, as you know, at the moment, uh, you have hardly any opposition municipality in, in Serbia and they are treated very badly. So um, I think we have to expect a lot of citizen courage for this type of change to occur. And I hope uh, that this responsibility for the future of our country will be there and that it will not be um, overshadowed by small personal interests, which has often been the case in how people have uh, assessed how they will vote. And uh, for a very long time in this country, we have, um, due to the circumstances, been focused only on individual interests, individual survival, and uh, losing the feeling for the collective, which I don't mean in a, in a way that's negative, but in a way that only the benefit of of all will bring the benefits to the individual. So let's see what happens this time, but uh, the role of the students will be crucial and I hope they won't let us down. Thank you. Thank you, Ivanka. Um, Florian, you are following the uh, development, not only in Serbia, but the whole region for um, decades. And uh, you are uh, having this, um, this uh, view from outside, but also uh, very um, uh, intensive contacts to the region and exchange with the region. When we look at the developments over the last years in Serbia with regards to the, 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 the political sphere and the possibility to, to develop uh, here, would you um, say that there is uh, also um, a, a slight uh, ray of hope that Ivanka described on the on the municipality uh, level that would uh, lead to maybe a uh, change a possibility to 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 uh, change the discourse in the future uh, will you describe that we have also uh, now uh, a more uh, gender balanced representation in candidates um, or is this all just a, a, a facade and not something that that should give us um, uh, hopes for for a possible um, um, opposition development and, and the change in the political culture in the country. Thanks, Sebastian. Thanks for the invitation. Um, I'm, I'm glad to be speaking after my colleagues who have really provided great insight. And um, so I can build on that. I mean, I would start by saying, I mean, I think we should first observe that Serbia is a competitive authoritarian political system. It's not a democracy at the moment. Um, I think my colleagues have alluded to that, but I think what needs to be explicit because I still find in discussions in Austria and elsewhere that often there's a sense that this is maybe just a democracy with problems, but the problems are of a serious nature, which I think don't allow us to call it um, a, a functional democracy at the moment. Um, and even though the opposition is participating, Sebastian, as you, as you pointed out, and as we've heard, the fundamental, as we has mentioned, the fundamental premise of the political system has not changed um, in the last years. So it's not that the system has become more open towards the opposition's participation. It's rather that the opposition decided, despite these circumstances, to participate. Uh, and, you know, I think there are both merits and drawbacks. Um, the last parliament has been the most illegitimate parliament in Serbian multi-party history in terms of the representation of society, as well as the performance of the parliament in terms of its attacks of incessant nature against opposition figures who are not represented in parliament, which is extraordinary. Um, but 
so in that sense, the institutions will become more pluralist and will become, let's say, more colorful in representing different points of view. But whether the country will become more democratic is really, um, uh, you know, there are serious doubts about it, considering the fact that uh, the chances of winning are limited, and they're limited because the playing field is heavily skewed for the incumbent, um, both in the institutional setup as well as in the media space. Um, and so the, the the opportunities which you, you've asked me about derive, I think, from, from, I think, one development which is encouraging in this circumstance is a greater coherence of the opposition. Um, uh, we've heard that there's, you know, in terms of gender and other ideas, more pluralism. I mean, we have a, a for the first time, a, for example, a green a green coalition, which I think which has good chances of, of of being successful. Which again, in the past we didn't have. Um, but it's also that we have really fundamentally two large opposition uh, lists, um, as as Vuyo has already pointed out which are the ones which the biggest promise. And this is something which we haven't had in the past, um, where we didn't have this kind of coherence of the opposition, um, which is you know, from the experience of other competitive authoritarian systems, whether it's Turkey or Hungary, let's say, to take pick fairly close examples, uh, or earlier uh, North Macedonia until 2016, the key for uh, challenging the systems is in elections and is through relatively unified opposition uh, lists. And so we've had both uh, a greater unity of the opposition with, let's say, the more standard opposition uh, finding a, a common voice and a common candidate, which is not self-evident, I think, as, as Ivanka has been putting it uh, in the past, often uh, personalities and egos got in the way. This has been less the case this time, which is certainly encouraging. The question is, will the egos return to the scene after next Sunday? Um, and having another a more liberal green list which again coexisted uh, with the main or coexists with the main opposition list. I think this has been very fruitful. Um, we had the kind of odd man out, the former president running on a separate list, but with very low success rate and kind of being a bit of a spoiler, I would say, in the electoral de de deliverance, uh, deliver campaign. Um, the other point, which I think is also very important to note, is that unlike in past elections, the far right, and I mean, I would agree with, disagree with Julio's characterization of the set of the right. I mean, these candidates uh, from the radical party to the sovereignists and the oath keepers are far right, uh, you know, parties which are really, I mean, in, 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 the, in the European party politics spectrum, would be, you know, to the, you know, to the right of Front National, Rassemblée Nationale or AfD, FPÖ. So really hardcore nationalist, uh, pro-Russian uh, parties, which are against any kind of liberal democratic values. Uh, what is positive is that these groups, although there are plenty of them, are not getting large support, but also that they have in a certain way divided themselves from the mainstream opposition. In the past, there were sometimes coalitions between or cooperation between mainstream opposition parties and far right parties such as Dveri, for example, and this is no longer the case. Uh, they've been rather... Uh, rather been um, instrumentalized by the regime uh, to some degree. So this is this is positive because it also frees the opposition from the far right, uh, which doesn't mean the opposition parties are all uh, in a certain way uh, fully endorsing, um, let's say, uh, all the all the underlying liberal democratic uh, assumptions, at least when it comes to the mainstream opposition. Uh, we'll talk, I guess, about the issue of, of Ukraine and the condemning the war uh, a little bit uh, later. But um, but they, they have, in a certain way, broken with the far right. And I think this makes also a pro-European opposition, a coherent pro-European opposition, a lot easier. The challenge, of course, is that we have a candidate, an incumbent, who is occupying the entire political space from proclamatory pro-European politics to uh, far-right pro-Russian politics. Um, so he leaves very little space for anybody uh, to, to articulate political difference uh, op options alternative. So this does make it and continues to make it, make it very difficult uh, for any opposition. Um, and a lot will depend on the coherence, not just uh, now, but also in the aftermath of the election. So far for now. Thank you very much, Florian. I would uh, like to um, continue on that, uh, what Florian has just mentioned and asked uh, Vuyo also in connection what you have mentioned during your uh, briefing, the abuse of minority parties. We've talked about the, the opposition uh, now and, and, and the challenges and the, and the dysfunctionality of the, of the political system. So the one question uh, would be, do you agree with uh, what, how Florian described um, the, 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 the current state of 
of Serbian authoritarianism. And the second uh, question in relation to this is, um, what role can these minority parties play and how uh, are they abusing their, their status as minority parties that you, that you briefly uh, mentioned? Yes, thank you. So, so I would actually like to respond to a lot of things that was already said by by other panelists. But, but let me try and 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 answer your questions first. Um, I, I absolutely agree with the with the with the characterization of the current regime as as competitive authoritarian or, or some form of hybrid regime. That's uh, that that is to me obvious as a political scientist. Uh, uh, that that uh, when we talk about the elections in Serbia, we talk about relatively free elections where candidates can can put on uh, can put up their list. Most voters can vote free of pressures and free of int intimidation. Most, but not all. Uh, but on the other on the other hand, the media environment, the public resources, these pressures of voters that do exist, especially in the public sector and especially towards uh, towards ethnic minorities, uh, voters which are in a in a, in an unfavorable, unfavorable socioeconomic conditions, including Roma Roma voters, these are all the things that that make it uh, unfair elections. Um, again, whenever I talk uh, about this type of elections, I mean, they are free and unfair. So whether voters should participate in these kind of elections, I would say that it's a tough question, but ultimately the answer is yes, for several reasons. But I, I would say that the, 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 the higher interest in the, in the elections, higher uh, participation is a good sign. Uh, uh, and then to, to, to go back to your other question about uh, the, the list representing national minorities, well, basically in Serbia, we, we, we still haven't got a, a good system that would allow uh, national minority representations based on substantial uh, protection of uh, of, of uh, national minority interests and advancement of their of their rights. Uh, that's partially based on the on the on the approach to national minority issues, which 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 makes the the, the state administration really difficult to put up objective criteria. Of who is an ethnic minority and who is not, and and therefore which list uh, uh, represents their rights and which doesn't. Uh, so there has been a long-standing issues about uh, uh, about uh, uh, registered political parties in the one ministry, in the Ministry of Public Administration. So or, or more than half of registered political parties in Serbia are parties of national minorities, and then the Republic Electoral Commission. Have consistently tried to prevent the abuse of the of the of the of the status of national minority lists of of uh, of the political actors which basically do not represent their interests. There are several things which are different for national minority lists, so they do not have to pass the electoral threshold of three percent in order to participate in the distribution of mandates. On the one hand, and additionally, in 2020. Uh, the the don't system that uh, that the that the Serbia is using or or the largest denominator they are they are they are uh, they are uh, they have a 1.35 uh, multiplication of their votes when they participate in the in the uh, in the uh, distribution of mandates and the, in uh, in addition this year uh, when the law was changed the number of of uh, signatures. Uh, certified signatures that every list uh, have to present in order to participate is halved for the national minority. So a lot of political actors who would otherwise not be able to participate in the elections and gain mandates are actually presenting themselves as national minorities. So this year, uh, the, the, the Electoral uh, Commission has rejected uh, three lists, uh, if I'm not wrong. Uh, uh, one uh, one list that was uh, Lakh minority, uh, one list that was Russian minority, and one list that was Slovak uh, community minority. But there was also a list which was which was uh, headed by an uh, extreme right uh, uh, political figure. Uh, uh, it's, it's a complicated case, so maybe I can talk about it. But I don't think that's more, uh, that's as important as as what. Uh, what occurred later. So, so, so uh, this list has been rejected by the Electoral Commission, and then uh, the Administrative Court has actually returned this uh, this back to the Electoral Commission uh, with the same argument as before. The Electoral Commission cannot the, the, uh, cannot uh, 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 go 
go uh, beyond their competences and say that the uh, political parties, which are already registered as the parties of national minorities, cannot also have that right in the in the in the elections. So so. Uh, we haven't seen uh, a, a proper way of addressing this issue. And I would say that a new law on political parties have to be actually introduced and a revision of already registered political parties have to be made. But again, when I say this, I have to warn about the political context in which the abuse of institutions and the abuse of powers are already evident. So, so even when I suggest that we need a new law and we need a revision of already registered parties, I'm also skeptical of the of the of the bias that might be present in such a process. Uh, as regards to the to the national minority parties, uh, uh, Hungarian national minority party is usually faring very well in the in the elections, and there will be the, the largest party. Uh, however, also uh, uh, there are other parties such as Albanian uh, minority and Bosniak party uh, that usually win uh, seats. Uh, other minorities uh, usually do not have, uh, you know, typical access to the to the parliament. And and I also have to say that that, that the majority, that the uh, Hungarian minority party is forming a coalition with the ruling majority. Uh, whereas uh, uh, Albanian parties are typically in the opposition and, and uh, the, the Bosniak uh, community parties sometimes in the opposition and sometimes uh, form the, the majority uh, with, with the ruling party. And also there are more divisions between uh, both the community, uh, both the Bosnian community and between uh, their political parties. So I would stop there and maybe open the floor to other panels. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I would now want to um, come to more of the, the the topics that that shifted in the electoral campaign. And um, here I've also seen that the uh, National Youth Council has um, very clearly positioned themselves towards the um, attack on Ukraine by the Russian Federation. This is not really the case throughout uh, Serbia, at least. This is what... Uh, um, is has been uh, portrayed. Uh, we've also uh, already heard that the uh, possibility to 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 politicize a little bit more the the not only the younger generation but the the society in general with the environmental protests have been completely overshadowed by the war that uh, has been started um, by the Russian Federation. Can you tell us a little bit more how? Uh, the shift happened and uh, how the the situation um, uh, with the stance of the of the Serbian voters towards this um, uh, this war uh, in Ukraine looks like. Uh, well, uh, when it comes to the situation, uh, we, uh, as the National Youth Council of Serbia, are, par are part uh, and full members of the European Youth Forum, so we are in constant communication with our peers and our uh, young colleagues from the Ukrainian National Youth Council, so uh, by this public statement we actually wanted to show solidarity uh, with young people who are now deprived uh, from education, who are now deprived from uh, um, possibilities to have their normal life. So um, we believe that we share it, uh, uh, the same values. And for us, uh, it is also as the generation that actually uh, was uh, the most impacted by the war in the Balkans, uh, we uh, we uh, felt a responsibility also to to um, to uh, communicate this message also towards uh, young people and um, our um, uh, youth organizations um, and when it comes to uh, when it comes to the environmental issues uh, we, we've noticed uh, because uh, we do annual research on the position of young people we noticed that the env uh, environmental issues uh, were more popular uh, among young people in 2021 which uh, also was uh, actually um, confirmed by the youth activism uh, in the uh, environmental movement that we uh, saw uh, after the August 
just when uh, the, the research uh, was published. So um, it is very important to young people not only to, of course, uh, um, uh, work on the um, those traditional traditional topics that um, maybe directly impact their, their lives and their possibilities for personal and professional growth, but also to think um, uh, from a different point of view and to have uh, this global and um, um, uh, important trends that are now, of course, uh, impacting their lives uh, as well. So uh, this topic was uh, one of the things that uh, maybe um, uh, grew to pop popularity uh, in the last year, uh, along with the importance of the topic of corruption, um, which was the, the second actually the most popular uh, when it comes to the interest of uh, young people in 2021. Um, and um, uh, housing issues that uh, I've mentioned that uh, was uh, mentioned uh, by almost all parties during this election process um, is also um, somehow connected to the uh, decent life and maybe um, the, the reasons that Professor uh, uh, mentioned um, when it comes to this uh, brain drain and uh, the readiness of young people to, to live abroad because they cannot uh, have the decent life uh, here uh, we see that uh, average uh, salary uh, for young people is uh, very low, that they do internships that are not paid, uh, that they uh, sometimes uh, for um, every fifth uh, young person, they cannot transition well from the education to uh, employment. So uh, they spend um, over than two years um, in, in this limbo and not having an opportunity for, for additional development. So that was that is also along with the, the uh, data on um, uh, where, where and how can they find uh, and support their independent life um, are the main reasons why uh, people, every second young people in 2021 um, is willing to live abroad rather than, than stay here. And of course, all of that is connected to their uh, uh, belief that they cannot influence the decision-making processes. Um, and um, uh, we, of course, get the situation that young people are um, not in opportunity or uh, they believe that they will have in a recent future opportunity to uh, impact the, the decision makers. Um, and one of the topics that was maybe mentioned uh, in this campaign uh, a bit more than it was uh, in the previous ones uh, was the topic also of internal mi migration. So um, uh, the topic of uh, uh, rural youth um, and um, unfortunately we didn't receive um, much of a concrete measures and concrete policies on how um, should political actors support um, uh, rural youth, uh, but at least we, we got mention of uh, this important aspect of youth policy um, and um, we actually tried uh, as, as the National Youth Council to uh, motivate them to speak a bit more, um, but maybe maybe that, that will um, have the space after the elections and once we have um, um, the National uh, Assembly set. Thank you. I have uh, two more questions and then I would open up the floor also um, for the ones who joined us a little bit later in the room, but also, of course, um, online. My colleagues will, as I mentioned, transfer them to me. Ivanka, um, as a concerned citizen, as you as you uh, so beautifully described yourself, um, when we look at the situation um, that, uh, with regards to to the, the overshadowing of the uh, of the war for the for the um, potential of um, the environmental protest and to become a, a real um, a, a maybe uh, influencing um, topic for for these elections, do you think that? Uh, with this, with this war, the the, um, uh, the also the, the the chances on the municipality uh, level have have shifted and and will influence here the possibility um, of of mobilization. Thank you, Sebastian, for the question. Uh, I think what we have now is um, this. Um, uh, it's not a very nice thing to say, but this situation uh, with the invasion of Ukraine has, in terms of election uh, strategies, perhaps assisted the ruling party because 
uh, really this um, uh, momentum regarding environmental issues was, uh, I think, taking a strong hold and uh, engaging all levels of society and uh, especially the engagement against uh, uh, what were the mining rights of the Rio Tinto company regarding lithium. Um, this was where this um, general mass uh, population um, uh, opposition to this actually had affected at least initially what the government will do, what will happen at the end, whether this will continue or not, I don't know. Uh, but at least now this has uh, died down a bit. And this was, uh, I think, showed that a mass uh, movement of, on a certain topic can make a difference in this country. And uh, with the shifting of the narrative to uh, possible shortages that may occur in Serbia regarding food, energy, uh, gasoline, and so on. Th this is, um, with people who have very limited incomes, this, uh, and also bringing back memories of the 90s, it's a very powerful tool to get people uh, really focused on what they think is relevant for their daily life, even though the environmental impact is not only on their daily life, but on their future. So I think it's a no brainer to realize what is uh, more important, but still the power of the media is such that I think um, the environmental issue has successfully been put on hold as it's okay, we'll deal with this, but now we really have to make sure that our country will survive these turbulent times that are coming and due to no fault of ours. I think this is very important to, to address this point and that um, uh, in this way, the government is showing how it's doing everything it can to protect the interest of the, the common, the little man. Uh, this will have an effect on one part of the, the population. And then it boils down that the environmental aspects will stay a priority topic only in those municipalities where this is really a, a life or death question, where they are uh, directly confronted with, uh, with problems in their municipality regarding pollution. So um, unfortunately, I think this uh, development uh, will affect the outcome of the elections. And uh, it's a shame. And uh, when you put it all together, considering everything that um, former Yugoslavia went through in the 90s, we are fully aware of all of the tragedy of the loss of life, uh, the material destruction, uh, political manipulation that arises in such situation that one would think that we would have a very um, clear stand on that we are uh, against the war and uh, everything that entails. So I, I think that uh, regardless of the result of, of the elections that Serbia will be facing very strong challenges in how to continue in these changed uh, uh, world circumstances. Thank you very much. So, um, Florian, you, you have been uh, participating and, and leading also a lot of uh, discussions with regards to um, the war in Ukraine and, and the effect on, on the region. Um, of course, feel free to comment also on this, but I would um, also be interested that how you would evaluate the, at least as I have perceived it, complete lack of debate about the European Union and the prospect of Serbia becoming a member in the electoral campaign. Does that not play a role anymore? Or is that is that just exploited? Or is that a given? Or the EU has abandoned the enlargement process anyways? Um, so what do you uh, what would you say to this? Thanks, Sebastian. I think that's a that's an insightful observation you've had. I think the EU and European integration has not become an issue, not just in the election campaign, but in Serbia, as well as across the region. Um, and it's partly got to do with the fact that this process seems so stuck that nobody believes in it anymore. I mean, surveys we've done last year uh, with our Balkans and Europe policy advisory group across the Western Balkans showed that people overall want to join the European Union, but many of them don't believe anymore in that they will join. And Serbia has actually the highest rate of skepticism in the region towards joining the European Union, um, the lowest support for joining, as well as a very high rate of people who believe that uh, they will never join. Um, so that kind of both 
euro skepticism as well as skepticism even among those who are supporting the integration um that they, that will they will achieve it i think is 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 exactly reflected in this election campaign you don't win elections either as government or as opposition to talk much about the european union the government says of course we're going to continue all of that but you know uh, the opposition can't really gr grasp that topic because also, the EU leaders have been supporting the government, maybe not uh, not uh, in all aspects, but in the public visibility, there's been very little critical voices from the EU. So the opposition can't really use that as a as a as a way to say, well, you know, if you want to be a democracy uh, and join the European Union, you have to change. Um, this message has not been come, coming from the European Union, and that makes it a lot harder uh, for the opposition. Um, but I would say, I think one thing which is very important is that, of course, this Euro skepticism in Serbia is a product of a deliberate policy of the Vucic government over the last 10 years. I mean, citizens of Serbia have become a lot more Euro skeptic over the last 10 years, to a large degree, due to the incessant anti-EU campaigning of media controlled by the Vucic government. I mean, across the region, people are disappointed with joint with the European Union, with the slow pace of progress. But, you know, take North Macedonia, which has had actually much more made more attempts and frustrations. It's still further behind than the than Serbia officially in the EU process. Still, citizens are a lot more uh, pro-European than in Serbia. So all of this would suggest very strongly that this kind of erosion of support and interest in the European Union in Serbia is a product of the, the government's uh, policies. And I think this kind of ties to a point about uh, what, what Ivanka mentioned regarding the issue of the war in, uh, in Ukraine and the Russian aggression is that it's not so much that, um, I mean, of course, we can say that the Serbian government has been taking a pro-Russian line in terms of not joining the sanctions. So that's certainly true. But the framing is not pro-Russian, but it's 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 pro-Serbian or protecting Serbian interests. So the argument, if you take the main slogan of the campaign, is Mir Stabilnos Vucic. So it's peace, stability, Vucic. So the whole argument of the campaign is on I provide peace and stability. Uh, and that means we can't side with anybody because this is a problem. Right. If we side with the West, the Russia, Russia will, will not like us. If we side with Russia, the West will not like us. So we need to try to do everything to stay in this limbo, in this in-between space, which, of course, is what Vucic has been doing for the last 10 years. So he's, re he's using the war to reaffirm this need for Serbia not to align itself with one side. In fact, I just saw a, a survey by, by a, a Serbian pollster, Demostat, Again, we can discuss, as with any poll in Serbia validity, but it suggests that most Serbian citizens say that Serbia should be neutral on the issue of the war in Ukraine. So they're not, I mean, there is a 20, 21 percent of people who say we should side with Russia, 13 percent with the European Union. But this is the main frame. It's not saying being pro-Russian, but being neutral, which, of course, in effect means being taking a supportive position of Russia, but this is, and I think, but this is the narrative which Vucic has been promoting. It's this, you know, Serbia is best served by not aligning with anybody um, and with ev or with everybody. And, and so in that sense, this also is then a reflection that in fact, the government does not really want to join the European Union. It wants to have good ties with the European Union and talk about it, but it doesn't really want to join it. So that's why it's not a major issue. And the opposition can't, can't in a certain way criticize it because the EU is not offering enough, in a certain way, reasons to, to, to kind of put the issue of uh, democracy and rule of law uh, on the table. So this is, I think, why, why we stand where, where we do in, in the case of the absence of Europe in the Serbian election campaign. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have a question in the room? Yes. Uh, please just uh, push the button on the microphone um, and then everybody can hear you. Uh, this one. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the EU uh, question was exactly what I, uh, what I wanted to ask and uh, we've, we've got a very clear answer, uh, more or less building on, 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 on the problems. Uh, there's there's a there's a neighbor which is Macedonia and especially uh, part of it the Republic Srpska. Uh, so could could anyone also comment uh, on on the understand of uh, the supporting of of Dodik and more or less ruining another country maybe as well. Worst case. Thank you. So um, the question, how, how can 
the the stance towards the war also have a spillover effect in in the region and especially with regards to Bosnia and Herzegovina and the uh, Republika Srpska. Yeah? Um, any any volunteers, any takers from the panel? I, uh, if you want to, I can sure. uh, chip yeah, in. Please. I mean, I think you know I, there 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 is. I think maybe it's it's a broader question about repercussions of Serbian elections for the region. I mean, maybe to take it from there. I mean, of course, Vucic and Dodik are uh, have been sometimes you know um, buddies, but they also have different interests. Um, uh, again, Dodik has you know aligned itself to kind of changing the status quo in Bosnia, while Vucic has been supportive but also pragmatic about this. Again, keeping all the options open. So I think he's not been eager to have an open break in Bosnia-Herzegovina in the way in which Dodik has been pushing for, um, again, to not break, not burn bridges to the West either. He wants to keep all the options open. Um, but certainly we have an issue, and that's that's the broader issue in the region of pro-Russian uh, political actors, and Dodik is the most prominent of them. Um, and, um, and of course, there are others in the region, particularly if we take DF and Montenegro, the, the Serbian nationalist coalition there. Um, and there's a question of what will happen with all of them. I mean, I think in a certain way, the um, the war in Ukraine has uh, actually put them all in a weaker position. I think Vilora Dodik is in a much weaker position than he was before the 24th of February, because um, there is no Russian plane which can fly to, to Bosnia at the, anymore, or any a support of Russia which can be openly given to him anymore. And there's greater clarity. U4 troops have been increased in Bosnia-Herzegovina. So in that sense, I think um, the, the, the space of Russia to manipulate uh, in the Western Balkans has actually decreased since the 24th of February. So in that sense, I think we're, we're going to see interesting times in terms of how this how this will impact um, the region. And I think this also raises question of how Vucic will position himself after the elections um, in terms of its position towards Russia. He's certainly going to try to keep the, um, the channel open and not impose sanctions unless there is strong EU pressure. And at the moment, I don't see strong EU pressure on Serbia yet to impose sanctions. Um, and so in that sense, I think we will see a continuation of the status quo. And similarly, Mira Dodik in, in Bosnia-Herzegovina will try to hedge his bets. But we saw that in last a few days ago, sanctions were not passed in Bosnia-Herzegovina, not just because of Dodik, uh, and his party, but also because of Hadeze, the Croatian party, uh, also in a majority, did uh, opposed sanctions against Russia, which is, you know, tells you an interesting story of strange alliances which pop up in these circumstances. Thank you. Well, we have uh, parliamentary elections in Bosnia and Herzegovina this year as well. We'll certainly also um, talk about this, but uh, let's maybe return back to, to Serbia. Um, I've seen Vuyo sometimes nodding, sometimes also raising his eyebrows. So I have the feeling um, that there might be some comments that you want to give to this, but I would also um, maybe additionally, you can bring that in because on, on the things that I have written down after your briefing is also this um, uh, question um, with regards to the to the polling station for the uh, Serbs in Kosovo, um, how you would further evaluate this? I mean, we are in the OSCE here. Um, we have to talk about the the the, the um, uh, question of um, uh, electoral legitimacy. Le you know what I mean? Yes, I do. Uh, I'm I'm clearly being too expressive on this on this Zoom uh, Zoom panels. I'm in my room in my home, so I'm just like I'm speaking with friends, so to say. Uh, yeah, so so I'm I'm mostly reacting to 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 the the, the issue of of Serbian relations with the EU, and and and, and I, I I agree with most of what Florian is saying. It's it's a complex issue. Um, both for the, the Serbian opposition and for the EU and for the Serbian government. Uh, what I always want to point out is that is that the support for for EU in the in the Serbian public is not so low as as we might expect. It is the lowest in the region, but but it's stable above fifty percent or around fifty percent, and it's been stable since two thousand eleven. So it's very strange that when you look at this decade. Of, of Serbian Progressive Party in power and the ups and downs that it had in the relations with the EU, this trend has not really changed. So the, the support is there and it's stable. And I think it's partially to the to 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 partially has to do with this approach that that, that Vucic has 
with the EU, and I agree with with Florian uh, that, that, that that the way that that it that, that the EU is being presented is not as you know the union that Serbia should join, and not the union that Serbia should join because of the values it shares. It's the it's the political actor that Serbia might gain some benefits from. And this is something that that that's, that the voters of the ruling party understand and accept. And this is partially explains their support for the EU integration. Like some of them would vote in the referendum for the for the for the for joining the EU, and it's not a, it's not a, a minority. And then when you look on the other side, the opposition party and opposition voters are more attached to the EU because of the values. That the, that the EU represented the values they share. However, the relations with the EU, uh, the relations of the of the EU towards the Vucic government, which has been increasingly authoritarian in the last decade, has really shook their convictions. And this is something that's being uh, expressed, for instance, now in the campaign. I mean, we have talked about how the campaign has shifted after the Russian invasion in Ukraine. So, so as Florian mentioned, the, the ruling party has shifted their campaign from the, from the typical, you know, look at the, all the economic progress we made to peace and stability. So there has been a clear shift. They, 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 they've done that in less than a week after the war started. The right-wing opposition, which has mostly supported Russia, uh, Russia which is against the EU anyhow, has used this what happened in the Ukraine as a proof that they have been right all along because they are promoting the narrative that this is all basically the consequence of NATO expansion and in the Eastern Europe and so on. So, but what the center and left opposition have, their situation is basically such that they have only mildly positioned themselves towards this issue. Really, if you look at it, there have been statements, they have made formal statements, they have been arguing, uh, about the war in Ukraine a little bit, but they have not changed their 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 campaign, and this is partially because I think that they are not sure about the convictions of their voters, a, and b, they are afraid of the vilification in the in the government friendly media and in the tabloids if they show too much support for EU and too much support for 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 Ukraine in this war, so so. All of this, I think, explains how 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 these actors have been have the have been uh, behaving lately. And uh, I'm sorry, I forgot what the other question was. The legitimacy question. Yes, with regards to the cost of election. So, so we we, we are basically having a repeat of what happened you know, on uh, January 16 uh, here when the referendum for constitutional changes uh, was uh, was organizing. Uh, what happened in uh, basically in December last year is that there were talks between between Belgrade and Pristina on on uh, organizing the voting process uh, in uh, in uh, in Kosovo, and then it broke down uh, basically in December of the last year, uh, uh, and this is primarily because of the position that uh, that Kurtis government is taking since it has been uh, elected uh, about Serbia having to change. Their position first, in order to have any 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 meaningful dialogue. So, so there have been requests from the Pristina coming to to the uh, authorities in Belgrade that they that they need to treat Kosovo as out of country voting. So, treat your polling stations in Kosovo as you would treat uh, as you would have a voting in Canada, basically. Which, of course, the Serbian government, for the for its own legitimacy, doesn't want to accept. Uh, so what we had in the past was that uh, uh, polling uh, was organized in the in the, in in several they call it um, uh, points uh, in in Kosovo and then OSCE would uh, take those uh, election material take it across the, the the boundary to 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 uh, Serbian municipalities and then the votes would be counted there. Uh, what happens now and what happened in January? 
is that there will be no polling stations in Kosovo. And instead, the voters have to cross the boundary. They have to go from one municipality, cross the boundary, go into, into four municipalities, and there will be new polling stations uh, opened there. Uh, uh, that means that, that we will be able basically now to see how many voters have actually been there. I mean, uh, there is around 100,000 registered voters in Kosovo, uh, much less really present. And, and, and I would expect a very, very low turnout because this is such a big, uh, big, uh, big effort that voters have to do in order to, in order to uh, express their will. Uh, and uh, CERTA, the organization that I am part of, will basically monitor those, those polling stations also. So we will be able to basically make a report about how the, how the polling went in those, uh, in those 40 or so places. Uh, in uh, in four Serbian municipalities. Thank you. We are coming to the end of our discussion. And um, normally I ask the question, what, how, you, how you would think that the election uh, will turn out and who will win um, at the end. Maybe we can um, adjust this question a little bit, giving the circumstances. So um, I will ask twofold question. The first part would be why, despite the situation that we know who is probably going to be the next president, um, do you think that uh, uh, it is important uh, to uh, participate in this election? And in four, respectively five years, will there be a different outcome? Um, I would uh, start with uh, Miljana. Uh, for us, the most important uh, thing is that uh, young people uh, go and vote. So we uh, hope for a higher, significantly higher uh, turnout of uh, young people. And uh, um, being uh, uh, very much discussed, I mean, the position of students and uh, young people nowadays and uh, the media coverage that they received uh, in regards to whether some um, uh, of their votes could be bought, I, I believe that young people People will uh, show to the media, but also to all the actors that they cannot be bought and that uh, they can vote for their own interests. So that is uh, my my hope uh, for for the upcoming elections. Thank you, Ivanka. Well, first of all, I hope that the outcome of the election will give us a more more balanced representation in all parliaments, because now we have a very lopsided situation which is, does not allow for proper dialogue, which could give possibly constructive results. So I, there, I think it would be very important that there is this now living parliament where we could hear uh, all representatives of uh, no, rep representatives from all parts of society. And I agree with Ms. Page that it's very important that young people vote. I think this is the key point and that actually they will decide the outcome of the election, whether they engage or not engage. And, I really wholeheartedly uh, invite them to vote uh, and I, I'm sure that uh, they can make a difference even though they have doubts that they can. Thank you, Florian. Again, I mean, I think any changing of a, of a, of a competitive authoritarian system tr takes time and it takes usually a first, uh, you know, uh, smaller electoral successes at local level. And maybe this is an opportunity now to start opening up again the public space. I mean, I think this is the problem. Many voters don't even have a chance to find out about the opposition except when they are attacked by the government and the ruling party. So I think, you know, it's about gradual steps to challenge these systems. And I think this is it's a long journey. We've seen this in Hungary. We see this in Turkey. We see this in other types of regimes. They usually don't change by themselves, but they're changed through elections uh, at some point. It's probably not this Sunday. But uh, but maybe the beginning of a process which allows for a more competitive political system is laid by the results. And certainly there are certain signals in having a coherent, more coherent opposition. Uh, also, the rise of environmental issues, which citizens also care about, and they will care about it again. I mean, this is not forgotten. It's just maybe not on the agenda right now. So all of this, I think, that does point to um, a different a different type of political space in Serbia. The question is when and not if. Thank you very much. And uh, will you please? Yes, thank you. So 
I'm also looking forward to to these elections because no matter of what the outcome is, there will be again the representation of opposition parties in the parliament. I think this is really essential for for uh, for the future of democracy in Serbia. Uh, I'm also hope that there will be substantial representation of, 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 you know, both the environmental issues and of youth. I mean, the previous parliament was one of the parliaments, uh, one of the youngest parliament, if not the youngest parliament we ever had with the highest percentage of millennia, of um, the uh, millennials, even uh, Generation Z, but, but they weren't substantially uh, representing the interest of the youth. And I hope now this will change. And the same goes with the environmental issues. Now we will have the, the Green Left Party and, and most of them, are, uh, some of them are environmental activists which are entering the parliament. So they might actually push these issues uh, uh, further into the mainstream. And when I think about, you know, the, the next four or five years, I, I really think many of, much of it hinges on, on how the opposition will actually go through this period of, of, the, next, of the next parliament. Uh, as we already mentioned, uh, be, being an opposition in, in a competitive authoritarianism, it, it's, it's really not the position you, you, you want to be in. The, the, the political opponents are being constantly vilified as, 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 as many other critical voices, including the journalists and the academia and civil society. So these new MPs have to survive that and they have to show that they're ready for this. And also uh, the coherence of these of this coalitions will also be at test. Because, you know, as we, as we have seen in 2016, the, the, the coalition lists have fragmented into smaller parties, smaller parliamentary groups, and this is another test. So not only in relation to the ruling majority, but also maintaining the cooperation between themselves. I think in the, la in the next year or next two years, we will already see how well are they adapting to this new role. Thank you so much. Before I say uh, goodbye, I hand over one more time to our host, who um, also has uh, one last question. Yeah, uh, thank you, Sebastian. Um, I just uh, have um, some kind of concluding uh, question for the panel, and that is, to my knowledge, um, many of the opposition election events in Belgrade have been um, cancelled during the last weeks. Uh, and uh, the question now would be, is that due mostly due to the, let's call it weak mobilization potential of the, um, of the opposition or whatever reasons do you see for that? Whoever wants to, to answer, <laughs> feel free. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, sometimes no answer is then also an answer. Um, I don't know uh, if if just uh, the the situation uh, is not uh, that clear. I think uh, that is also fine. Um, in any case, I would like to say thank you very much. Of course, to our host, um, I would like to say thank you very much to um, the people who were uh, participating. Um, offline here in the Hofburg or also um, online on the live stream, but especially, of course, my wonderful panel. Thank you very much, uh, Florian, Ivanka, Muyo, and uh, uh, Miljana for a uh, wonderful, uh, insightful discussion. I think we've covered uh, a lot of different topics and um, we are very much looking forward to continue the discussion um, after the election uh, is finished. Uh, Vuyo has uh, compiled this wonderful briefing, which will be uh, available on the website of the IDM shortly. Uh, the same uh, is uh, true for the recording of this um, discussion, um, which will be also available on the YouTube channel and on our partner uh, pages. And um, if you in general uh, want to uh, be informed about additional elections, um, just subscribe to our social media channels and uh, um, uh, take an uh, abonnement of our newsletter um, to, to stay up to date because there is another important election in our region on Sunday, uh, which is going to take place in 
Hungary, uh, we will evaluate this um, and uh, speak after that um, on next Thursday. Same building, different room with almost the same partners. Very much looking forward to this. Um, thank you very much for um, this wonderful setting, the wonderful discussion. Take care and uh, see you very, very soon. Best regards from Vienna. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.